This is our Sunday School lesson for July the 9th, 2017. This is still out of Unit 2, Calling of Prophets. This is lesson number 6, and it is titled from our Faith Pathway Study Manual, Who? Me. The devotional reading is Isaiah, the 66th chapter, verses 18 through 23. Our background scripture is Isaiah 6, and our printed passage is Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. Our key verse for our lesson for today is I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah 6, uh, verse 8. Our lesson's aims are, Explore the circumstances of Isaiah's call and his reaction to it. Since... Isaiah's emotions as he reacted to his call and answer God's call to service. Our lesson mentions in its aims uh, a focus on the circumstances of Isaiah's call. And uh, I think it's uh, significant that we look at the conditions uh, which uh, were present uh, which also Isaiah lived through before he accepted uh, and received his call uh, to be one of the Lord's appointed men of God, uh, to be the prophet. Now, Isaiah actually had lived through the reign of uh, two other kings prior to the time that Isaiah Oz uh began uh, his kingship. Uh, he had lived through Ahaz and also through Hezekiah. And Ahaz was a, uh, noted as a very wicked king during his reign uh, during the time of Judah. But Hezekiah was a righteous or a better king. Hezekiah humbled himself before the Lord and received the blessings of God. Uh, and actually, uh, Isaiah actually counseled Hezekiah uh, during the time of the Assyrian invasion. And uh, Hezekiah listened to godly counsel. And therefore, as a result of that, he actually uh, prospered. Uh, during that time. Now, uh, after Hezekiah, then uh, Hezekiah's son, who again is a wicked ruler, and uh, he actually uh, was a part of the uh, sacrifice or the killing. Uh, it was during his reign, uh, Manasseh, that uh, Isaiah was severed or was cut in two. And it was during the reign of Hezekiah's son, Manasseh. And uh, so we kind of see a pendulum effect here. Ahaz is a wicked ruler. Hezekiah, the pendulum swings back. He's a good ruler. He passes, and now we have Manasseh comes in, and he's a wicked ruler, and he's a part of the uh, killing of, of uh, Isaiah. And But Isaiah accepts his call during the time of Uzziah. Uh, now, Uzziah, um, uh, he uh, was a good king uh, at the beginning of his servitude. Uh, but we learn through uh, Chronicles, uh, Second Chronicles, the 26th chapter, verses 16 through 21, that... Uh, that Uzziah, he uh, actually was successful uh, doing the beginning reign, but um, he kind of got a little headstrong, shall we say. 
Uh, he became uh, consumed by his uh, victory. And uh, as a result of this, he overstepped his boundaries and he entered into the uh, Holy of Holies. He entered into the uh, altar uh, to provide incense uh, unto God, which was a function, which was a practice of the priest. And uh, it was okay for Uzziah to... Um, remain as a ruler, as a king, even to be victorious in victory. But uh, for him to step out of his reign, to step out of his place and enter into the place of the priest, uh, he received a immediate uh, result of his actions because he was stricken with leprosy. Uh, and as we read in Second Chronicles, uh, the 26th chapter, verses 16 through 21, and if you read uh, ahead of that, just uh, leading into that, uh, you see of how Uzziah was uh, victorious in battle. And this, this somewhat led to him becoming headstrong and thinking that he had no boundaries. Uh, and that happens a lot of times to rulers and kings is, is that they become prosperous and vic victorious in one area. And because of that, they step outside of their reign and then they be begin to think that there are no boundaries for them and that they can do whatever they choose, uh, whenever they choose, uh, to whomever they choose. And uh, Uzziah stepped out of that uh out of his place and uh, proceeded to perform the functions of the priest and God showed immediate dissatisfaction with this and he was struck with leprosy uh, and then he lived in isolation until the time of his death which brings us into our lesson we begin to discuss uh, the circumstances or the conditions which led to Isaiah's call and he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, that he too saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up. And the presence of God, his train, the presence of God filled the temple. Now, we know that scripture tells us in John, the first chapter, verse 18, that no man has seen God at any time except for his son, Christ Jesus, who was in the bosom of his father, God, the self-created one. He has declared him, thus saying that Christ, who was in his bosom, has declared Almighty God. But no human, no physical no normal individual has seen God at any time. And there are different scriptural references that we should uh, pay attention to. Because what God has done is God has revealed himself to mankind in different visions. And many uh, men of God, prophets, uh, have spoken of that they were in the spirit when God revealed himself. Uh, one such passage is uh, Moses in uh, the book of Exodus, the 33rd chapter, uh, verses 17 through 23. And it speaks of how God was telling Moses that you cannot see my face and live. So he hid Moses in the cleft of the rocks and he put his hand over the pathway to see him and Moses only saw the rear. He saw the backside of the presence of God, but he did not see the face because no man can see his face and live. And then Elijah tells us that in first Kings, 
uh, verses uh, chapter 19 and 12, he talks about how that he uh, experienced the presence of God, but it was revealed to him in a still, small voice. Uh, also, Job talked about uh, being in the presence of God, but he said that it was in a whirlwind. Uh, this was in Job, the 38th chapter in verses 1. So many different passages in the Bible speak of the presence of God being in the environment, in the atmosphere of men. But they have never seen the actual face or the, uh, the seeing the actual holiness of, of God, but they have seen what God revealed to them. And just uh, here, Isaiah, as he is speaking, um, just uh, to be in his presence felt like he was consumed, that it filled the temple, that just the train, and then speaking of the train, God always reveals himself in types. Uh, things that man is familiar with. Kings used to wear long robes that had trains attached to them, had material that that like was draped in the rear of their of their robes. So he said just his train filled the temple to give Isaiah some idea as to how powerful and how majestic the presence of God is. Now, as we uh, proceed further into our lesson, uh, we see that in part of this preparation, getting Isaiah ready for his call. Uh, also, it would be good for us as we're talking about the circumstances or the conditions that brought about the calling of Isaiah. If we'd also focus on the preceding chapter to verse 6 in Isaiah, uh, we would learn of the certain conditions that were, were brought to uh, Isaiah's attention uh, to bring focus to what he was called to and what he should leave behind. Uh, we recognize that uh, in the fifth chapter of Isaiah, when we begin speaking of uh, the circumstances, uh, leading into the sixth chapter, starting at verse 8 in Isaiah 5, verse 8, it mentions the six woes that came upon unfaithful Israel. Now, remember, again, Isaiah is called to the southern kingdom of Israel called to Judah. But here are the six woes that were mentioned prior to Isaiah's call to service. It says, woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. Now, this was the first woe. The second woe is in verse 11, and it says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night, until night, and then till wine inflames them. This was the second woe. Then the third woe starts at verse 18, and it says, Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity, as sin as if it were a rope. Sin as if it were a rope. And then verse number 20 gives us the fourth woe. Woe to those who call evil good, and good evil and put darkness for light and light for darkness 
who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe number five says, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And woe to men who are mighty at drinking wine, men who are valiant for mixing intoxicating drink, who justify the wicked for a bride and take away justice from the righteous man. Now these are the woes, the six woes that were brought upon uh, Israel, specifically into the uh, southern kingdom, that set like the stage for Isaiah as he began his call, the acceptance of his call. So now, as we move forward, we are told that uh, God sends a seraphim. These are angelic uh, beings. These are servants of Almighty God. And he sends them, and uh, the Hebrew word or translation of the seraphim means that they are angelic beings. They are fiery means they they are uh, consumed with the zeal and presence of God. And it talks about how even the seraphims identify the majesty of Almighty God. Uh, where they are uh, where Moses was told that he could not look upon the face of God and live. Here when we look at the composition of the seraphims, the angelic beings with the fiery zeal of God. When we hear of their description, it explains to us that they had six wings, two wings that they would take uh, and fly to their appointed destinations that God Almighty sent them to. The other two wings were to cover their face uh, to cover their eyes, and then the uh, other wings were to cover their feet. Now, when we when we recognize uh, this here, it is is that they themselves covered their face. They wouldn't even look upon. They wouldn't even look upon the presence of Almighty God because of the holiness and the purity and the righteousness of Almighty God. Even uh, the servants of the Lord don't see his actual presence. They are consumed by his righteousness and holiness, but they don't see the actual face of Almighty God. And then even they are still in honor and respect and homage unto God because the scripture tells us that they were singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the self-created one. And when we get over into the fourth uh, verse here, it speaks about how that just the presence that was so enormous so consuming that it filled the temple that it talks about how that the doors the post of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried out and the house was filled with smoke now many times uh, when we hear about uh, the presence of God, uh, smoke and uh, clouds and uh, fire and uh, different things that are associated with the things that God has created, uh, mighty winds and the force of the water, the elements and things of nature that God created are used to identify or to re reveal to us some of the qualities and the elements of God's presence and God's power. Now, as we get towards the end of the lesson, 
beginning at verse 5. Because of how powerful and majestic the presence of God is, Isaiah begins to be overwhelmed by this. And he responds by saying, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Uh, we sometimes see a display of behavior and attitude of people, uh, some who know the Lord and others who don't, but their attitude, their state of mind, their behavior displays as though they have equated God with that of themselves, as though I would just tell God what I think. Uh, I would just, you know, I, in, in fact, I got questioned for God myself. And when I'm in his presence, I'm going to tell him, uh, what about this? And what about that? Uh, as though they're talking to a a normal human being, uh, someone equivalent to that of themselves, not taking into effect that many times we don't even go out into the weather because it is either, it is either too hot, it's too humid, or it's too cold, the temperature is frigid, but yet we're going to stand boldly before the one who made these things and ourselves as well. But here we're going to stand boldly before him and then say, and I didn't like this. And why did you do that? And, and what do you have to say about this right here? Uh, we have some type of falsified like uh, uh, we were just overwhelmed with ourselves and began to think that uh, we we will not be uh, reduced uh, to nothing in the presence of God. That uh, we become so, for the lack of a better term, we become so cocky in our attitude that we act as though that I'm not afraid of God. I'll just tell it like it is. I'm going to keep it real. I'm going to say what I have to say. Uh, here, Isaiah begins to say that woe is me. I, I feel uh, less than purposeful. I feel less than uh, an individual that can even uh, uh, respond to the awesomeness of God. So God recognizing that Isaiah was subdued and felt unworthy to stand in his midst. Then he sends unto Isaiah, who, who now has repented of himself, who now has humbled himself, and now has said that I'm unclean. I'm not worthy uh, to be in your presence. Uh, I'm a, a part. My lips are unclean. The people that I run with, the people in my company are unclean. We are a fallen nation. Then God sends his appointed angels, the seraphims, and one of them takes a live coal. And it says from the altar with thongs and places it on the lips of Isaiah. And now those things that rendered Isaiah unworthy, the text tells us that because the seraphim placed it in his mouth, that it touched his lips it removed his iniquities, his wicked practices, and his sin was cleansed. It was purged. Um, when we think of this, um, uh, many times uh, our reflection of fire and its purpose is, is that fire burns uh, 
Uh, it burns uh, certain materials. It consumes them. Uh, it it re, it removes uh, large buildings and structures. That fire is destructive. But when we think of the way God uses fire, God uses fire not to destroy or to consume the individual or the element to whom God sends it. But when God uses fire, it is in the means of purification. So it doesn't destroy the containment of whom God is about to use. So instead of it burning Isaiah, it purged Isaiah. It, it, it removed and took away those sinful things that would have hindered Isaiah from fulfilling his service unto God. Isn't God awesome? He recognizes our frailties. He realizes that we are weak, but he understands that it is he that has made us and not we ourselves. He understands that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And so therefore, while we recognize that we are not fit for the charge, that we are not able to f fulfill the demands of the mission, the, the, the uh, work that Lord God Almighty has placed before us, but he recognizes that he is able then he knows that all I have to do is remove those things that hinder you from serving me. And then you will be my vessel for service. So he sends the seraphims and they, through the process of purging and cleansing through the intensity of fire, it doesn't destroy, but it removes those impurities, such as the working of the metals of silver and of, of gold. The heat is raised to an intensity where it removes the impurities, so much so that once the impurities are removed, only the pure metal, only the pure residue of that which the impurities were removed is left to the point that it be it creates a mirror image where then you can look into the purity of the metal and see yourself and that's what God does God removes the impurities from us so that we are able to look into the image that God has created and see God in us. So we hope that something has been lifted uh, from our lesson. Uh, I would add to the part of the purpose of fire that in your leisure, if you would read 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, uh, verses uh, 12 through 15, it speaks here about our work being challenged or tested by fire. And if it's built on the true foundation, which is Christ Jesus, if it's built on that foundation, then it will withstand the test of fire. But if it's built of ourselves, then it would be consumed. And also that another scripture that speaks to how God challenges us is, is in First Peter the fourth chapter and the 12th verse, which speaks about that we shouldn't think it to be strange when we are tested by fiery trials because they, those tests remove certain elements and certain uh, dispositions and certain characteristics that are unpleasing to God. And when we come through the end, and those things have been removed. We feel better about ourselves and we recognize how we are empowered when we remove ungodly things and we receive 
the righteous and godly things of the self-created one, our Lord, our God. So, uh, as always, our prayer is, is that the continued blessings of God would be upon you and that his word, which he has taught, taught us in scripture, will not go out and return unto him void. God bless you and God keep you.